Hello, welcome back to another Zmatlab MBA live YouTube edition, I guess. Um, I'm here with Sam today again. Um, Sam's not in Michigan anymore. Um, we're in Florida, Sam, right? Yep, How's Northeast it Florida. It's going, it's sunny. I'm right next to the beach, enjoying the waves, really nice. Very cool. It's, um, it's almost zero degrees where I am, so. <laughs> it's not all that great here. So we are talking about school selection today. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted you to be here is because for my own school selection, I took a very um, kitchen sink approach, you know. So I applied to every single school I could possibly apply to. Um, I only wanted to do round one. I didn't want to do round two at all. And um, I applied to, I think, 11 schools. So um, my advice may be a little bit tailored to people like me, like risk averse, and uh, just has a lot of time to apply to a bunch of schools. I wanted a different perspective as well. So uh, we're going to talk about our own school selection strategy for about maybe 15, 20 minutes, maybe take a few questions, and then see what happens, right? Um, okay, so let's start with your school strategy. I'd love to start by knowing how many schools did you apply to, why did you pick those schools, and uh, what do you think in hindsight you should have done? Yeah, uh, so I was doing round one as well, um, and I was only kind of doing that top 12, top 13 in round one. And if I didn't get any of those that I liked, I would have moved to some other schools like UW, uh, yeah. Texas Austin in round two. Uh, within those kind of top 12 schools, um, I tried to, I mean, I tried to really prioritize what were my schools that had a better chance of getting into. Um, and then also, I knew a little bit about more schools, knew a little bit about more of some of the actual areas that they were in. So the schools in New York City, like Columbia and NYU, uh, great city, great schools, but it didn't fit me, the lifestyle and also kind of the industries that they were they more tailored to. Um, so it kind of matched up this kind of, can I get into it? Could I be there for two years? And then also, what are the strengths of the school and how does that fit with uh, what, I, what, I, what you're looking for? Right. So which school did you end up, end, end up applying to? Um, what was it? All the top, I think all the top 10, except for Columbia, I did not apply to Harvard and I did not apply to Stanford. Um, right. Columbia was the New York City thing. And Harvard and Stanford were, I did not have, I didn't think I had a great chance of getting in. Um, yeah. in, in hindsight, um, I think that's the other thing is to look for the DNA of the school and look for the DNA of people that they look for. Um, yeah. I'm gonna have a non-traditional background. So I think that my profile would have fit probably much better with Harvard than opposed to like MIT or Wharton. And so I wish I would have applied to Harvard instead of those two. Right. I think, I think that's something that I wanted to chat with you as well, because I think, um, so by the way, let's just get this out of the way. I applied to all schools. I applied to everything. I, the only school that I did not Okay, let's talk about this. Um, I applied to HBS. I applied to Wharton. I did not apply to Stanford um, because I just, I just really hate the what matters most to you and why essay. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I just never could imagine myself uh, BSing my way around that essay, you know. So, uh, so those are the. So I, I, I applied. To two out of the top three schools. Uh, coming to the middle section, I applied to um, NYU, I applied to Ross, of course, I applied to Tuck, um, applied to um, UCLA, applied to Berkeley, um, Booth, Sloan. Um, yeah, I think that's it. The only schools here I didn't apply to was Darden. Um, I, one of the reasons I did not apply to Darden um, was because I just didn't really have a great time when I was uh, doing my outreach with them. And I felt that um, um, I was a stronger fit in the other schools. And there's only so much time, right? If I was going to apply to 11 schools, 
um, I might as well be a little bit picky in the picking the 11 out of the tw uh, 20. Uh, I also did not apply to Yale because I just never luck liked Yale. For anybody watching the video, look, Yale is a fantastic school, right? But if you are looking to reason, looking for reasons to go to Yale, I am just not the person to give you those. Um, the other thing is, in the next segment, I applied to like what you said. Um, I wanted to play safe, so you would save them for round two. I applied to them in round one, so I, I applied to McCombs. I applied to uh, Foster, UW, and um, yeah, that's it. So those, those were all my schools, 11 of them. So um, just talk a little bit about why I picked these schools, apart from the fact that, well, um, they're there and they're the top 15, top 20 schools. I think my biggest thing was I wanted to get a job in uh, either tech or consulting. And I wasn't really sure um, which um, path I should pick. And I, um, I'm very envious of people who, who know for a fact that they want to be in tech or they want to be in consulting or they want to be in marketing or whatever. I could never really make up my mind because A, I've never worked in the US. I don't know what kind of work that's gonna be. And B, um, I was, I had a very non-traditional background. So, I did not really know what any of these jobs would be like. I had a fair idea about tech working for startups, but um, that's, that's, that's not even remotely close to what I'd be uh, doing post MBA, right? So, um, so yeah, so those things were, uh, were my true indicators. And the schools that I applied to were both, uh, they were doing fairly well in both tech and consulting, some better than others. Um, so yeah, those were my pri primary motivators. And then I think what I realized later was that I understood and learned a lot about these schools more when I actually decided to apply to them. Um, I started talking to current students, started talking to alums. I sort of, you know, like memorized the whole website. So the process of application actually uh, gave me a lot of, a lot more information about the school I mean, in hindsight, maybe I shouldn't have applied to NYU. I did get in NYU. It was a good moment, but I realized that NYU is not going to help me with my goals. It's going to uh, wreck me in debt. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's sort of what my school strategy was. So let's talk a little bit about specific schools. Like, of course, both of us in, in Ross, I also had admits from Tuck and Foster and McCombs, NYU. Uh, I mean, get, saying no to McCombs and NYU was fairly easy because I think Ross was objectively a better school. Uh, my biggest decision was between Ross and Tuck. Um, and um, definitely would like to go between, uh, go in the direction of why I chose to pick Ross. But I wanted to hear from you. Like, for example, you seem to have, uh, you interviewed in a lot of schools, right? So let's talk about those days when you were interviewing with <laughs> and Ross, and uh, in the, you know, you could have gotten into both of them. Tell me a little bit about what would you do if you had gotten into Booth and how did your wants and needs um, meet with, now that you're in Ross? Do you think you made the right call? Yeah, that would have been a really tough decision for me. Um, I think after I got into Ross, so I got into Ross and waitlisted at Booth. And so waitlisted, you had to do a couple more essays and wait yeah. till basically their second round. In that time, I started talking to a lot of people that I can at Ross, especially ones I connected with during the interview. And it became really clear to me that Ross was gaining in strength and was particularly strong in tech, but very strong in their recruiting numbers as well. And so for me, I thought Booth would be objectively better because it's higher ranked and that would correlate into just stronger job prospects. Right. Uh, but talking to people, it didn't seem like it because the people I talked to, they had picked Ross over Duke, over Tuck, over even Yale, over other Ivy League schools, and they were happy with it. So that's what kind of made me very feel very good about Ross, and then it moved up in the rankings. And so it made me feel to the point where I didn't even do the, the essays for Chicago Booth to try and like fight my way off the wait list. I just had had enough at that point. I mean, 
like you said before, filling out nine, 10 applications is like, by the end of it, I was exhausted. I didn't want to fill out another application or another essay. So yeah. I was pretty, I felt really good going into it once I decided on Ross and then going there and it, you know, it really worked out for me. Everything checked the boxes, everything worked out in my dream to get into tech. I think the thing that if I had to go back, I think you're going to see a lot of job statistics on career reports. And I think a yeah. big thing is to really distinguish from students on the ground that are there, what is the difference between what companies come on campus and off campus and what are, how's the school doing in both? Yeah. Yeah, definitely want to head in that direction now. Um, so for me, uh, let, let me start with my, my experience first. Like, as, as I mentioned, uh, I didn't really care because I, I, could, I could see myself getting into consulting. I could see myself getting into tech either way, right? So for me, it was more important to get a job that sponsors, get a job that I like. And as, as long as they don't treat me like crap, like I would be okay. Um, so, so getting into Ross helped me, but I actually did not know a lot of companies that come to campus at Ross. For example, I did not even know that Ross was such a big school for Microsoft and Amazon, uh, which became two of my target companies once I came here, right? Um, so having said that, if I happened to go to Tuck, do you think I'd be able to have the success that I had with tech recruiting? I think Tuck, from what I know, about their interviewing there, talking to people there. It seemed like talk is very strong for Northeast consulting or financial services or banking. And that has a lot to do with a lot of the people come from the Northeast that go there and a lot of people stay in the Northeast. I think they do have pinpointed strong ties and apparently their net the alumni is very helpful um but there's just not enough numbers i know that micro with microsoft is a big recruiter at tuck so i think you would have had there but it's i don't think it's anywhere like what they do at michigan so yeah i think if you wanted to do tech i think michigan was a better would would be a better choice or was a better choice for us coming out you know a year and a half ago yeah, I think that's where, like, I think you did your research, I didn't. And I think I got lucky because um, I happened to get jobs in tech. Um, I would say, though, that do, doing that research with both the employment reports and um, actual uh, research by talking to current students is going to be really, really helpful. The second question that I had for you was, uh, and this is coming from, school selection strategy, like basically hacking the school selection, right? So one of the things that I keep hearing from students, and I, I heard that when I was in school, is that you go to a good school where your employer comes to campus, but is not really known for that industry. What I mean by that is if you want to get a job in Amazon, a lot of people say that being at Ross actually puts you at a disadvantage. Then... Uh, for example, a school like Tuck or Yale. And, the, and one of the reasoning, it sounds a little bit twisted, but it also makes sense, is that uh, so many people at Yale and Tuck want to go to consulting or Amazon is just not their priority or not, their, not in their process. Uh, however, a lot of people at Ross, they really want to go to Amazon. Like Ross is known for, you know, things like ops and whatever. And Amazon is such a big, big, uh, recruiter at Ross, um, getting into Amazon from Ross would be very competitive as opposed to like Talk and Yale where Amazon is not the biggest recruiter. Um, so do you agree with that? Like what, what would you talk to, say about that? Yeah, I, I don't agree. I think that, I think that strategy works if the industries or companies have sort of this quota almost from each school. I think I've heard that strategy works with investment banking, like Ross does fairly well with investment banking because they don't have the numbers and the competition is lower. And so everybody that goes, if they have a, you know, if they all have uh, citizenship or residency, most of the people get it.
But I think with tech, I don't think there's quotas. I just think that schools are, the companies have favorites among the schools because people have historically gone there and done well. I think for Michigan, uh, we know just from, you know, talking with the recruiters, you and I, that Michigan is my, one of Microsoft's favorite schools. And so you're just going to have more of a spotlight on you if the company likes the school. And I think for off campus, I think it's even more important that there's people that, that the company is, has this track record of, of having successful candidates from that company. I think Zillow is another one from Michigan. Michigan people have been doing well there. And so they look for Michigan people. So I don't agree. I think that you, I, you want to put, you want to give yourself the best chances. And I think those best chances are when companies really like recruiting from the, the school that you're looking at. Yeah, that makes sense. So I want to talk a little bit about you know, like the non top 10, the non top 15 schools. And um, you didn't apply to many of them. I did to some, uh, but a lot of people I'm pretty sure will ask about, hey, I don't have a 740 on the GMAT. I don't have a 700. I have a 680. Uh, which school should I go for? So you can't tell them, yeah, apply to Wharton or apply to Tuck yeah. or apply to Ross. It's going to be really hard, especially if you're an Indian applicant. So if you don't have the stats to make it into you know, one of these big schools, but you still want to get a job you want, what would your recommendation be? I have some thoughts as well, but I'd love to hear yours first. Yeah, I think mine are really limited to tech because that's that's what I was shooting for. And I kind of know that recruiting world a little bit better. Uh, I think not top 10. I think UW is a great school. And especially if you have any inclination to go to the companies in Seattle. I think UCLA is a great school also. Um, I think Carnegie Mellon is a great school. They do really good with recruiting across the board for tech. Uh, and I think UT is a really good school as well. And so those are schools that I would have switched to, you know, applying to if I didn't make it into my round one, um, any of those round one schools. So I think those schools are are great, you know, and I, I wouldn't even say second choice, to be honest. I think those schools are inherently great schools and have great career statistics as well. Right. Yeah, I would say similar things. And also like for consulting, I think. I think uh, CMU, I think Tepper does really well with consulting too. Uh, and also um, McCombs does pretty good with consulting, especially in the uh, Houston offices and Dallas offices. So uh, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's too much of a compromise, you know. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I think uh, going below those schools as an international student, especially, I would be very anxious to go below those schools. Um, so if, like, for example, a lot of people on GMAT Club have been uh, looking at a few questions on the forums and people have been talking about, oh, should I go to this one, which is like a top 40, or should I go to this one, which is like a top 50 with a scholarship? So I'm, a, I'm going to be a little bit nervous because and I, I, I have a few friends from Boston University and they all managed to land really good jobs, so they're really good for them. But I feel like when I'm spending so much money and if, even if I get a full ride, uh, living in the U.S., especially Boston, is so expensive. Uh, when I'm when I'm spending so much money, uh, I really want that strong ROI, you know. Uh, so I personally, I would not recommend uh, going to a, a school that's beyond top thirty. I mean, I, that could be my own biases and reservations, but that's just how I. Think. Uh, I think Foster, Austin, uh, you know, Tepper, they're all amazing schools and there's no compromises, but beyond like, you know, Emory, Ken Flagler and uh, beyond those bands, I don't know. I'd be very anxious, especially yeah. if you're an international student. I think if you're, if, if, if you are a U.S. citizen, I think, I think the bar is a lot uh, lower for you to apply to school. You can go to any school you want and if you network your way through really well, I think you're going to have a great time. Uh, but if you're an international student, I don't know. I'd be, I'd be really, really nervous. All right, yeah, so, I, I agree. I agree. And I think, em, I think Emory is a sneakily good school, not in the top 10, especially for career stats. Oh, Emory is awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially with consulting. I think they yep. do really well with consulting. Microsoft comes to campus. So yeah, a lot of, lot of really good stuff.
All right, I'm going to take a few questions now. I have a, I have a feeling that we're going to get some very similar questions. Uh, so let's see. My age is 20. I have a 740 GMAT with two years of work experience uh, I'm in sales. I have, I don't know what that is, 30. Oh, okay. It's Indian Indian money. In the span and the undergraduate, maybe. I do not understand the last <laughs> part of your question. Uh, your GMAT is great. I think uh, you're just 20 years old, so you you need to um, calm down. I I, I I think if you really um, uh, do well at work for, in the next couple of years, I think you're in good shape for a good MBA program. Um, we're going to take the next one. I have a GMAT score of 640, 11 years of um, experience for managerial five years. I need advice on good colleges and I have to look at school, US and Europe as well. Uh, my list of you to be a stretch. All right. So, uh, Sam, I'll let you take this one, but just, just so you know, uh, 640 uh, as an Indian will be tough. Uh, yeah. Especially if you have an 11 years of work experience. So, I would look at uh, schools in the top 20 to top 30 range. Uh, I would look at Emory, I would look at Kenan Flagler, I would also look at maybe Georgetown. Um, I would look at these, these, these schools, but again, uh, and Foster, of course, Foster, depending on what you want to do. But I would still say, though, that even with those schools, um, it'll be hard with a 640 and 11 years of experience. Uh, I think a better route for you is to do um, is to do a one-year MBA or a executive MBA in a better school. Yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be hard with that GMAT score. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, I have an entrepreneurial background. Should I plan? And I plan to stay with it post MBA. What are the schools I should avoid applying to? I would prefer working post MBA for a couple of years if I get a job. All right, so I mean, I'm gonna be a little bit mean here, so I'm. So I hope that's okay. Most people who say this thing, like I have a, I, I, I have a, I have a startup, and I want to come back after the MBA. They are, they are almost always um, not being entirely truthful. Let's just say, uh, and and again, this for Shrey, I mean, I don't know, maybe maybe you have a great startup. But if you have a decent startup, why would you leave, right? Like you would never leave. If it's working well, you would never leave. And then uh, you would leave, go to school and work for a couple of years and then come back to your startup. In five years, everything will change, my friend. Like uh, your startup will not exist. Or even, even if it does, who's going to manage it? There's a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, I think try to like really figure out what you really want to do. Like really, really what you want to do. Um, and if you want to just get rid of the startup and just look for a new job, that's a fine pitch. That's absolutely fair. Uh, uh, admission people will see through that. Uh, nobody goes back to their startup after MBA um, if, if the startup is doing really well. So, Sam, what do you think? Am I being too harsh? No, I think you're right. And I think that there are really strong ways to tell that story. I've worked at a startup. It was great, but it's just it's not going to advance me to where I want to go. And there's very strong reasons why I use them as well, because I had a couple of startups there and they really hit home with employers. So I wouldn't be afraid to tell that story if that's your story. I think that uh, if you really want to learn how to work at startups, if it's working, stay with it. If it's not, then you're talking about, you know, Stanford, uh, maybe MIT. I don't know. You're talking about the top of the top where people take go out on those limbs after right after MBA all the other ones it's everybody's trying to get a full-time job with a bigger company is their first goal right I did get a follow-up from Shrey it's a family business I mean well like it look it's good if it's a family business but then why do you need an MBA I mean you can you can just do the job that you're doing and do it well uh, uh, an MBA would definitely provide you with a lot of education into how to like you know get more out of your business but you can get those in Coursera. Um, you can get those yeah. in, the, in, in the world. So an MBA would not really, I mean, I don't know. That just may be my opinion. But anyway, like to, just to answer your question, uh, I would say um, for entrepreneurship, um, a lot of schools are better than others. Stanford's great. Berkeley is great. MIT is awesome. They have the innovation labs. Uh, I think these three schools are like the best for entrepreneurship. HBS, of course, is great for entrepreneurship. 
a lot of uh, people out of HBS choose to go down that path and do not uh, get uh, full-time jobs. So, uh, so yeah, so, so there you go. Um, could you suggest some good GMAT prep books after the official guide? Yeah, GMAT Club. I think GMAT Club has a lot of uh, book sections. So uh, just go to GMAT Club and find the books that you want. I would recommend the Manhattan books. I think they are sort of uh, the best. Uh, could you suggest some good university in Europe for an MSc? Um, Europe's pretty difficult to pick because it depends on what you really want to do. For MSc, uh, I think uh, the, the big ones are LBS. Uh, they have great masters in finance programs. And uh, there is you know, Oxford and Cambridge with the judge in the state business school. Because, of course, there's INSEAD, but INSEAD only offers MBAs. Uh, and there will be other, other schools as well. HEC Paris is one of them. Um, IMD in Switzerland is a great school. They have smaller class sizes and they tend to, uh, they, they tend to prefer slightly older candidates. Okay, Sam, next one's for you. Which school would you suggest for MBA with a specialization in operations management and supply chain? Well, Which I think that's... <laughs> I, I think Michigan Ross is pretty strong with there. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I don't know. What are the other ones? Yeah, I think Michigan Ross is great because of the of the Tauber program. Uh, so you can do a dual degree in especially in an operations school, and, and I know a lot of people do that. I think it's the most common dual degree option within the uh, MBA students. So I would explore. I I, I would ex explore that. Um, if if you were you, uh, if if I were you, then um, for other operation schools, I think MIT is really really good. But it sort of depends on what you want to do. If you want to uh, be strict in supply chain, I think probably Ross is your best bet. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, let's see. I'm getting a lot of new questions now. Um, I'm 20 years old. Okay, if you're 20 years old, you have a, you have a lot of time. If you, if you want to do, do a master's in finance, you can uh, you can probably just stick to LBS. I think LBS will be your best bet. 720 the GMAT, six years of work experience in operations in manufacturing. Could you suggest some schools in round two? I plan to work as a management consultant. Yeah, okay. So I'm guessing you did apply in round one too, right? Uh, so it would depend on your round one schools, but... With that GMAT, I would pick things like, I would pick schools like Emory. I would pick maybe a TUC. Uh, TUC some, sometimes is very forgiving to GMAT scores. I would pick Foster. Uh, but if you're looking at just supply chain management, I would also talk to Ross as well. But the 720 might be a little bit difficult there. But again, just so you know, I'm throwing a blanking statement out there. Schools might be a little bit more forgiving to lower GMATs. Uh, and again, by the way, 720 is a great GMAT. It's just not good enough for Indians, uh, un un unfortunately. Um, so, uh, but schools may be forgiving this year to um, MBA students because application volumes have been going down. So I have a feeling that uh, the average GMAT would not be as high as it used, used to be. So, okay, let's see. LBS or HEC Paris? Um, LBS, dude, um, any day. Uh, Sam, do you disagree? No, I think LBS is one of the strongest ones in the world. So yeah, it also has an extremely, uh, you know, prestigious brand name. So yeah, nobody knows what HEC Paris is outside of France. So yeah, um, awesome. So I have three years of experience of ma managing sales and distribution business in emerging markets in lower tier cities of India. Is my profile unique or overrepresented? Uh, which US schools to apply? GMAT 680. It's very overrepresented. Look, if you're an Indian, you're already overrepresented. <laughs> it's just what it is. And if you have a 680 GMAT, I'm sorry, dude. Uh, you have to look at top 25 and top 30 schools. Uh, the best school out of that category comes to me as Emory and Foster. Those two are my favorite programs. Um, Founded two startups, sold one in the founding team of the third. Uh, raised the first round for, okay, you did a lot of startups. GMAT 680, which called GMAT will, even if you did a lot of startups, your GMAT still matters. Uh, and uh, founding of two startups, selling one, then again, it sort of raises some questions in my book. Um, 
how old are you? Like if you did all of these things within the kind of like four or five years, I would think of you as someone who doesn't really know what they want. So it all depends on how you craft your story, but I would uh, be cautious with that GMAT. I would still apply to Emory, Foster, and all of these schools who, who would be okay with a 680 GMAT. Um, but it sort of depends on how risky you want to be. If you want to stay risky, uh, you want to get onto a more risk, you can apply to higher level schools as well. How did you guys manage to your recommender since you applied to more than 10 schools? Okay, this is a, this is a good question. It was really difficult for me to do this. Um, the recommendations are very similar. You're right. They're actually pretty similar, and some of them, most of them have the same questions. I had to, um, I, I mean, my boss sort of knew what I was getting into. So I had to prime her for a very long time to tell her that, look, this is something that I'm going to ask you to do, and... Uh, just just have to get it done. Um, help your recommender as much as you can with examples, with bullet points yep. about what you want him or her to say. Make the job as easy as possible for them. Sam, what, what's your opinion? Yeah, my two recommenders, uh, both were, you know, good colleagues, close friends. One had been in education before at uh, high-end school, so he knew the drill. So I didn't really have to say anything to him. He already knew what he needed to do and he got it in pretty quickly. The other one, it just was a unfamiliarity with the process. So I had to definitely stay on them. Uh, you know, just send examples, uh, especially of wording and phrasing and what points to hit. And, uh, you know, just just stay on it. But it's, if you pick people that are you're close with to any degree and they care about you, um, it should be, you should be able to go back and forth with them. It may take may take that, but you should be able to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One last question. It's getting late in here. Uh, GMAT score 730, have seven years of work experience in engineering and some consulting, have co-founded a startup, community work for schools. Um, look, I mean, I think everything's good in your profile, to be honest. I think if you can, if you're an Indian guy, you if you up your GMAT a little bit, I'll be a lot less anxious. If you're an Indian woman, I think you're in great shape. Uh, I think with that profile, you can apply to Harvard, I, in my opinion. So I would be um, happy with that profile. And uh, depending on how you choose to articulate your accomplishments, um, you'll be in uh, a pretty, pretty, pretty good shape. So those are all our questions. Sam, thank you again for coming. Um, we are going to do another video. Um, I think after the holidays, we're going to take a break till the New Year's. Um, well, what are your plans for the holidays, man? I'm going to be in Florida for a bit, go to Orlando, go to the Universal and Disney. Awesome. And, yep. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We had a lot of engagement uh, and a lot of questions. I'm sorry I couldn't take all of them. Uh, but please feel free to post on the GMAT Club forum. Most of these questions have already been answered there. Are there a bunch of people who would be happy to take your questions? Uh, well, see you. See you in the next video. All right. Goodbye. Bye, everybody.